Section number thirteen of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alex Soyer. Stone Fruit. Olive Tree throughout antiquity we find the olive tree acknowledged as something venerable and holy and taking precedence of all other trees even the most useful on account of their nourishing fruits or the refreshing drink they furnished the wise minerva gave it birth and its foliage which adorned the brows of the goddess served thenceforth to crown victory or to give rise to the sweet hopes of peace a green bough of olive rendered the suppliant inviolable the deadly arrows of hercules were made of its wood from it princes borrowed their sceptre and the shepherd its crook if abandoning mythological fictions which surround the olive with a charming but false poetry we interrogate history for more certain information concerning this revered tree we shall find that diodorus of sicily informs us minerva discovered and made known to the athenians its useful qualities and a writer in whose possession the most ancient records in the world were found moses who has recounted the birth of vegetation tells us also of a patriarch pouring purified oil on a stone altar before the olive tree was known in athens nay before athens existed profane historians honor artesius son of apollo and king of arcadia with the invention of oil mills and the manner of procuring the precious fluid the abundance of which was such in the east that it was used in lamps in anointing in seasoning of dishes and in numerous other instances too long to enumerate thus the most important culture among the jews was that of the olive tree there were large plantations of it in all the provinces galilea samaria and judea were full of them it must not however be thought the hebrews used olives only to make oil they knew how to preserve them in brine to be eaten at table and for sale to strangers pliny particularly estoils those of decapolis a province of the holy land they are very small he says not larger than capers but are much esteemed among the greeks the oil of samos was considered to be the purest and finest next to it they gave preference to that of caria or of thurium as regards olives the columbades or floating kinds were more esteemed than any other on account of their size and taste they had an exquisite flavor imparted to them by being placed with different herbs in pots of oil the halmade olives were preserved in brine the cultivation of the olive tree was carried to great extent in greece a host of poets sang in honor of this tree which produced so sweet a fruit and theoprastius speaks of it very frequently in his celebrated treatises on plants as romans were not acquainted with it until later and even in the year two hundred and forty nine b c they possessed so few olive trees that a pound of oil sold for twelve arias or three shillings less than two centuries after seventy four b c ten pounds of it only cost one arius but italy had so far increased its plantations at the end of a few years fifty two b c that it was 
able to furnish olive trees to the neighboring counties in its olives and oil were thought excellent however those of grenada and andalusia were preferred to them even in the time of pliny on account of their sweetness and delicate favor that illustrious naturalist has transmitted to us particulars on the highest interest on the cultivation of the olive tree and the various preparations which its fruit requires or rather to which it's necessarily subjected for the luxury of the table those who are curious on this subject may also consult cato the first among the romans who has written on this tree verio on columella concerning the art of raising the plants of gathering the olives of extracting the oil and of preserving the olives themselves this latter operation was performed as follows they took twenty-five pounds of olives six pounds of quick lime broken very small and dissolved in water to which twelve pounds of oak ashes and water in proportion were added the olives were left to soak for eight or ten hours in this lye then taken out washed with care and immersed for eight days in very clear soft water which was changed several times they then took hot water in which some stems of fennel had been infused this plant was taken out and the same water saturated with salt until an egg would float when it was quite cold the olives were put into this pickle as regards the lodge olives or colibolades they were sometimes crushed after the first operation that the brine might penetrate more easily and odoriferous herbs were added to give them a better flavor this was the way they prepared those from the marshes of ancona the only ones admitted at the tables of gourmets at rome olives made their appearance in the first course at the beginning of the repast but sometimes after their introduction the gluttony of the guest caused them to be served again with the dessert so that they opened and closed the banquet the distributions of oil to which latin authors often allude were somewhat rare for a long period the people looked upon this fluid more as an object of luxury than of a necessary of life and it was only on extraordinary occasions that they were gratified with it thus when scipio africanus began his cruel edelship each citizen received a measure of oil after his example agrippa made similar distributions in the reign of augustus they became more frequent under the emperors and severus ordered that an immense quantity should be brought into rome venafra a town of campania supplied excellent oil pliny says it surpassed that of all the rest of italy however in those days and at present much was consumed of a very bad quality for instance that which was served by a clumsy amphitryon to julius caesar and with which this prince seemed perfectly satisfied a proof that the celebrated warrior was either a man of exquisite politeness or an epicure of very scanty ability independently the culinary preparations in which oil was abundantly used the ancients also employed much of it for anointing themselves and when at the bath a slave always carried some in a vase with which they were rubbed it was believed that the vital heat was then concentrated and the strength increased and health preserved augustus inquiring one day of polio who ought to be done to preserve health in extreme age very little was his answer drink wine and rub yourself with oil we shall conclude this article by transcribing the recipe of an odoriferous oil for which the liburians 
were celebrated and which apicius considered worthy of his attention pound some alder and cypress sedges with green laurel leaves till they are reduced to a very fine powder put this powder into spanish oil add a condiment of salt and stir this mixture with great care for three days or more then let it remain for some time olive oil was little known in france under the two first races of her kings in the reign of charlemagne it was drawn from the east and africa and was so rare that the council of a de chapelle eighteen seventeen allowed the monks to make use of the oil from bacon in fourteen ninety one the pope allowed queen anne of bretagne then afterwards the whole province and successively the other french provinces the use of butter in seasoning on fast days palm tree the poet pontinus has related in beautiful latin verses the history of two palm trees cultivated in the kingdom of naples for a long time there had been a fine one growing in the environs of otranto loaded every year with flowers and yet producing no fruit in spite of the vigor of the tree and the heat of the climate but one summer every one was much surprised at seeing the same tree produce a quantity of excellent and very ripe fruit astonishment changed into admiration when it was discovered that another palm tree cultivated at brins fifteen leagues distant had that same year blossom for the first time from that period the palm tree of otranto continued to yield fruit every year notwithstanding the distance between it and the one at brins the palm tree which mythologic ages consecrated to the muses was very common with the hebrews to whom it supplied an exhilarating beverage called shkar which is often mentioned with wine of the grape moreover everything was useful in this tree the wood was employed for constructing buildings and for fuel the leaves were used to make ropes mats and baskets and the fruit served as food for man and cattle from the dates a great quantity of honey was extracted but very little inferior to ordinary honey and those which were not consumed were sent abroad with so much more ease than they kept well according to pliny this fruit was in reputation in greece and rome and he named several excellent species which come from judea and principally from jericho and the valleys of archelaus livaeus and phasalus two greek writers inform us that the favorite of herod nicholas of damascus a poet philosopher and historian much liked by augustus sent to the roman emperor every year a peculiar kind of date from palestine and that the monarch who became very partial to them gave them the name of his friend bread and cakes were also made with them we shall often have occasion to remark that dates were frequently introduced in the composition of the most exquisite dishes of the romans dates not quite ripe if exposed to the sun become in the first place soft then pulpy and lastly acquire a consistency similar to that of french plums they can then be preserved and sent to foreign markets riper dates are squeezed to draw out a sweet juice very pleasant and which is put together with the other part in large vessels and kept in that state or buried in the earth these are the ones commonly used by the rich as food the others are given up to the poorer class dates are eaten either with or without preparation or mixed with different kinds of viands their syrup is used as a sauce to various dishes 
They are also completely dried for exportation. When reduced into flour, the caravans in the desert employ them as food. By crushing them in soft water, wine is made, which produces a strong spirit, very agreeable. The best dates are yellowish, semi-transparent, odiferous, and sweet. Cherry Tree When on a very hot summer day some inviting cherries deliciously quench our burning thirst, we very little think of offering to Mithridates a souvenir of affection and gratitude. Such is man, he enjoys his wealth, and cares very little for the benefactor who has procured it for him. This ancient king of Pontus, of toxicologic memory, and better known by physicians than gardeners, did not, however, pass the whole of his life in composing poisons and their antidotes, for his royal hands planted, and sometimes grafted, and it is to the this useful pastime that we are indebted for the sweet fruit the name of which recalls to mind the city or country which was its birthplace ancient authors have told us it is true that europe is indebted for its cherries to lucullus and that he made use of the cherry tree to ornament his triumphal car Honor is therefore due to the Roman general, but on condition that Mithridates shall lose nothing of his glory, or be eclipsed by the renown of this great conqueror. The researches of several naturalists led us to believe that cherry trees already existed at that period in Gaul. This tree delights in cold climates and the wildest forests of France contain almost the whole of its varieties. Perhaps at Rome they knew no other than the wild cherry tree, which on that account was very little sought after, and Lucullus probably brought it to notice by bringing some grafts or fruits from Caracas. In this manner the passage of Pliny and that of Virgil can very well be explained which present the cherry tree as a new guest moreover the miscellanean xenophanes and the physician dipophilus of siphene have spoken of cherries long before lucilius was in existence dipophilus praises them in the strongest terms he says they are stomachic and have a delicious flavor this certainly cannot apply to the sour wild fruit which is to be met with in the woods and with which the most inexperienced palate is never twice caught at all events the authority of theophrasis would be sufficient to remove all doubts if any still remained he informs us that in his time the good cherries of Mithridates passed from Lower Asia into Greece, where they were gladly received as in all other nations, on account of their form, taste, and qualities. This happy gastrologic event was accomplished three hundred years before the Christian era, whereas the introduction of cherry trees by Lucilius took place two hundred and twenty eight years later the capital of the world knew not at first how to appreciate this present as it deserved the cherry tree was propagated so slowly in italy that more than a century after its introduction it was far from being generally cultivated the romans distinguished three principal species of cherries the apronian of a bright red with a firm and delicate pulp the lutinian very black and sweet and the cerealian round and stubby and much esteemed this fruit embellished the third course in rome and the second at athens 
The fruit of the cherry tree is eaten raw, cooked, preserved with sugar, and in brandy. It is also preserved dry or made into raffia. By fermentation, the juice of cherries with the kernel, by adding sugar, makes a very agreeable liquor, which is called cherry wine. A brandy is produced with fermented cherries drawn by the albamic, very powerful, that named Kirschen Wasser, in the province of German Lorraine, is a spirituous liquor obtained by the distillation of various species of wild cherries. Apricot Tree The apricot tree was called by the Romans Armanica, the tree of Armenia, where it originated. It must be looked upon as a useful moment of the valor of the masters of the world, if it be true that, after their conquest, they brought it from that province into rome the latins also named the apricot precocious because it ripens at the beginning of summer in june before other fruits at the time when pliny wrote a d seventy two the apricot tree had only been known at rome for thirty years and apricots still very rare cost one denarius or seven pence half penny each they were only to be found in the first-rate shops of the fruit market or emporium of the third region near the meta sudante which was only open every ninth day or near the naval camp outside the trigemenia gate some years later the agriculturists of the roman suburbs brought into the city some excellent ones at a very low price but the fashion and the taste for them had gone by the green apricot is preserved before the stone becomes hard when ripe it is eaten raw cooked or stewed in marmalade preserves are made of it as well as a dried paste which keeps a long time they are also preserved in brandy the stone as it is or broken is used in raffita or noyu lastly the kernel produces oil peach tree this fruit tree originally from persia was first transplanted into greece where it existed a long time before it passed into italy it was still quite a novelty in rome towards the middle of the first century of the christian era and the rich alone could eat peaches for they cost no less than eleven pounds thirteen shillings for halfpence the dozen or eighteen shillings nine halfpence each this is rather dear fruit however good it may be but the bill of fare of certain banquets will show us by and by whether the roman gastronomics knew how to spend their gold profusely when they wished to satisfy a caprice or enjoy some dainty curiosity it was believed in rome that the peach contained a deadly poison when gathered in persia but that once transplanted to another soil it lost its injurious properties this singular opinion still held by many persons in the present day has been refuted by pliny who treats it as ridiculous idea at any rate galen and discordes assert that this fruit is indigestible unwholesome and that it often causes fevers the high price of peaches and the short duration of their freshness caused amateurs to seek the means of preserving them for the longest possible time the following is the recipe given by apicius choose the finest of this fruit and place them in water saturated with salt the next day take them out dry them with greatest care and then put them into a vessel with savory vinegar and salt plum tree plum trees were known in africa from time immemorial and theoprastius 
speaks of the great number of these trees which were to be found at Thebes, Memphis, and especially Damascus. Athenius also praises the excellent plums of this last-named city, and we know that time has not lessened their ancient reputation. Asia and Egypt sent a great quantity to Europe, and, in order that they might keep better during this long voyage, a part of them were dried, and the rest were preserved, that is to say, the best, in honey and sweet wine. These were the only kind known in Rome in the time of Cato, 150 years B.C. But the Romans, then novices in the art of good living, would have but ill appreciated the delicate and perfumed pulp of the Damascus plums, at the moment when, hardly plucked from the tree, their fresh and velvet-like bloom delights the eye and tempts the palate of epicures. Two centuries later, the science of good living made incredible progress. A magiric atmosphere enveloped the capital of the universe with its delicious fragrance, and the joyous, free livers of Italy cultivated in their garden plums of the most beautiful purple and gold far superior to the much extolled fruit from damascus and memphis the fields everywhere offered such luxuriance of plum trees that pliny the opposition man or just milieu of that time complained of their number and grieved at what he fancied a useless and expensive profusion of them the ancient counts of anjou transplanted the plums of damascus into their province and the good king rene of sicily duke of anjou and count of providence introduced them into southern europe the plums of monsieur are thus named because monsieur the brother of louis the fourteenth was very fond of them the plums of rain claude owe their name to the first consort of francis the first daughter of louis the twelfth the plums of mirabelle were brought from provence into lorraine by king rene end of section thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 14 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer. Pip Fruit. Quince Tree. This tree appears to have been a native of Sidon, a city of Crete. From hence it passed into Greece, and soon became the delight of its voluptuous inhabitants. The environs of Corinth, above all, were noted for the sweetness and beauty of their quinces, which the enlightened luxury of Attica preferred to all others rome did not fail to enrich itself with a fruit to which the ingenuity of culinary art was to give a new flavor young plants were first imported from abroad and put in boxes but the romans knew not how to rear them and were obliged for a long time to content themselves with excellent quinces preserved in honey and sent from iberia and syria to the great capital at last they learned how to cultivate the quince tree and subsequently introduced it into gaul where it succeeded admirably they too could then enjoy with a certain pride preserves nothing inferior to those of spain and which the confectioners in the market of dainties kept in reserve with quince wines for the tables of the patricians 
and also the stomachic exhilarating liqueur extracted from the fruit of sweet syndonium which even a petite maltresse would not have disdained at a light morning repast at any rate the faculty this time agreed with culinary chemistry in recommending to epicures those delicious preparations it was asserted besides that the quince possessed the most beneficial qualities first as an ailment and next as a counter poison gourmandes made the mind docile and none doubted its marvellous virtues this fruit so much extolled was preserved by placing it with its branches and leaves in a vessel afterwards filled with honey or sweet wine which was reduced to half the quantity by ablution pear tree many countries have disputed the honour of having given birth to the pear tree according to some it was a native of mount ida so renowned for its refreshing fountains others said alexandria and in the opinion of some writers it came from different parts of greece let us add to this enumeration palestine where this tree grew at a very remote period it results from these different allegations that the ancients were acquainted with the pear tree that they cultivated and were fond of pears which is not at all surprising as they are an excellent fruit theophrases was very fond of them he speaks of them very often and always with praise the same thing may be affirmed of pliny and more particularly of galen whose medical authority was formerly of so much weight the learned physician of pergamo is pleased to recognize in the pear strengthening qualities which benefit the stomach and an astringent virtue which the apple does not possess in the same degree like us the greeks and romans distinguished several kinds of this fruit whose names indicated their taste and forms it is not certain whether they possess the bon chrétien which honors our tables in winter either raw or cooked this name reminds us of its origin which we will relate louis the eleventh king of france had sent for saint francois de paul from the lower part of calabria in the hopes of recovering his health through his intercession the saint brought with him the seeds of this pear and as he was called at court le bon chrétien this fruit received the name of him to whom france owed its introduction apple tree a very ancient tradition for it is six thousand years old represents the apple as being from the beginning of the world the inauspicious fruit to which may be traced all the miseries of mankind we crave permission to defend it from this accusation merely by these few words that it is nowhere written the holy books rarely speak of the apple tree if we are not mistaken it is only mentioned in five passages of the sacred writings and at periods very distant from the first offence of man therefore nothing indicates aversion or contempt on the part of the inspired writers for this tree which on one occasion serves even as a graceful term of comparison from which it might be concluded that the inhabitants of the east thought as much of it as other nations there is one and perhaps only one example of a singular and excessive repugnance to apples it is said that Yoladasus, king of poland no sooner perceived them than he became so confused and terrified that he immediately fled 
it certainly required very little to disturb this poor prince greece produced very beautiful apple trees and their fruit was so excellent that it was the favorite dessert of philip of macedon and his son alexander the great who caused them to be served at all their meals probably they were obtained purposely for them from the island of ukaba which enjoyed an extraordinary reputation for apples the athenian legislator the wise solon almost succeeded in throwing discredit on this ailment so much light by his fellow-citizens by a sumptuary law which he thought it necessary to establish the inhabitants of attica were fond of good living and when one of them took a wife he spared no expense to give splendor to the nuptial banquet a very excusable pride on such an occasion solon was in the habit of interfering rather too much in the affairs of others every one has his failing and this was his he imagined that his fellow-citizens fared too sumptuously on their wedding day and in order to curtail an expense contrary to his ideas of economy he ordered that the bridegroom should be content with a single apple while his guests were regaling themselves at his expense who would believe it this law was religiously observed by the greeks and the persians thought it so original that they in turn adopted it the latins gave a favorable reception to the apple tree and cultivated it with care eminent citizens of rome did not disdain to give their names and patronage to different kinds procured by themselves or which they had improved in their orchards the manilian apples were so called after manilus the claudinian after claudius their patron the appian owed their name to appius some others preserved that of their native country such were the sidonians the greeks and the epirotes after the conquest of gaul the romans introduced all these fruits and as the climate was more favorable to apple trees than that of italy they soon multiplied to a surprising extent france ought to be grateful to these proud warriors for a present that enriched that province of the empire and which perhaps still contributes to its prosperity lemon tree among the richest productions of medea virgil mentions a tree whose fruit he attributes the greatest virtues against all poisons the description he gives it seems to belong to the lemon tree however this may be its origin and even its identity have given rise to the most animated dissipations many have asserted that juba king of mauritia fifty years b c spoke of the lemon tree and that he looked upon it as being very ancient they add that libyans gave to its fruit the name of hesperty apples that hercules stole and which on account of their color were called golden apples by the greeks who were indebted to that hero for their introduction others maintain that no one has spoken of them before theoprasius who called them median apples after the place of their origin and that consequently those persons were wrong who confounded them with the apples taken from the garden of the hespertides these difficulties will probably disappear if we remember that the ancients had given to the lemon tree various names which belong to other trees the truth is that the athenians received it from the persians who were neighbors of the medes and from attica it spread all over greece lemons were only known to the romans at a very late period 
and at first were used only to keep the moths from their garments the acidity of this fruit was unpleasant to them and apicius makes no use of it those who wish to satisfy their curiosity on the subject may read the remarks of lister the celebrated physician of queen anne and editor of the works of this famous gourmet in the time of pliny the lemon was hardly known otherwise than as an excellent counterpoison fifty years after that palladius reared the plants which he had received from media and at last this tree was slowly naturalized in the south of europe a considerable number of anecdotes have been told of the anti venomous properties of the lemon athenius speaks of two men who did not feel pain from the bite of dangerous serpents because they had previously eaten of the fruit either this story is false or men and things have strangely altered apicius preserves lemons by putting each of them into a separate vessel which is hermetically sealed with plaster and afterwards suspended from the ceiling in another place we shall speak of the tables and beds made of the lemon tree so fashionable amongst the romans and for which they spent prodigious sums one thing remains to be noticed and that is that preserved lemon peel was considered as one of the best digestives and that doctors recommend it to weak and delicate persons orange tree if confidence is to be placed in some authors the native land of the orange tree would appear to be the gardens of the hesperides so remarkable in mythological ages and it was found also in western africa mauritia and the fortunate islands to which they add those mountains of atlas so little known in a botanical point of view notwithstanding the daring excursions of several learned men according to other observers it originally came from the southern countries of china from the islands of the indian archipelago or even from the portion of the globe called oceana one incontestable fact is that writers of antiquity were completely ignorant of the existence of this superb tree had they known it its majestic height the dark green of its foliage the suavity of its flowers its fruit so fine bright and so flattering to the taste could not have failed to inspire them with brilliant pages theophrates and the latin geoponics never would have neglected to speak of the luxury and fecidity it displays even in the season of hoary frost besides the name of portucan which is given to the orange by the arabs a name foreign to their language but which is again heard among the italians spaniards and even in the southern provinces of france is it not an indication that the introduction of this tree has some connection with the portuguese voyages to india particularly those of juan de castro in the year fifteen twenty it is the portuguese who have planted the orange tree in the canaries at madeira where it was supposed to be indigenous on account of the vigorous vegetation it there displays it is the portuguese who have introduced this tree into all countries washed by the mediterranean and it is still the portuguese who have furnished the parent suckers whence the spaniards have been enabled to form their immense groves in andalusia and Algavia. from the foregoing recital we may conclude that the grand polyphasic trivirate of antiquity architrastus valitius and apicius never tasted this fruit 
which heaven reserved for the appreciation of modern times blessed shades if attracted sometimes by the exquisite vapours of our stoves you should wander again round those succulent dishes which a more experienced chemistry enables us to elaborate if fruitless gastronomic reminiscences should lead you into the delightful retreat of some one of your disciples who by his enlightenment skill is there preparing the treasures of the dessert oh turn away your eyes from those enticing fruits which display their golden rays and rise in pyramids upon the a porcelain pedestal here are oranges the nectar and ambrosia of the olympian ages which you doubtless regret and we have again discovered these wonders of sweetness existed perhaps in china but you knew it not for china did not become a roman province but console yourselves giants of cookery we have not yet attained the high pinnacle of your art your wild boar a la troyenne your peacock's brains and your phenicopter's tongues secure for you a triumph which posterity will dispute in vain the orange known under the name of portugal orange comes from china not more than two centuries ago the portuguese brought thence the first scion which has multiplied which has multiplied so prodigiously that we now see entire forests of orange trees in portugal it appears to have been the custom formerly in england to make new year's presents of oranges stuck full with cloves we read in one of ben jonson's pieces the christmas mask he has an orange and rosemary but not a clove to stick in it at the present day we can dispense with this embellishment the first orange tree cultivated in the centre of france was to be seen a few years ago at fontainebleau it was called le Connetable, the constable because it had belonged to the Connetable de bourbon and had been confiscated together with all property belonging to that prince after his revolt against his sovereign fig tree antiquity sacred and profane has not left us on any other tree facts so clear and certain as upon the fig tree it is the only tree of eden of which the sacred books have preserved to us any mention in the east there were immense plantations of it egypt has some also and the land of cain produced figs which enabled moses to judge of its fertility in scriptures in order to give us an idea of the happiness and tranquillity the jews enjoyed under the reign of solomon tell us that in judea and in israel all dwelt safely every man under his vine and under his fig tree and the fruit of this tree was no doubt very dear to the hebrews since rubshaka the general of the assyrian army thought to seduce them from their obedience to hezekiah king of judea by saying to them come out to me and then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree thus the trade carried on with figs in jerusalem had become so considerable and active that esdras was obliged to indirect it on the sabbath day it appears that figs were arranged in small masses to which they gave the form of loaves or cakes either round or square which were sold nearly in the same way as at the present day from the east the fig tree passed into greece then into italy gaul spain and throughout europe the athenians pretended that this tree was a native of their soil and this people never wanted mythologic facts 
to support their assertions they imagined and would have others believe that the grateful ceres rewarded the athenian phytalus for his hospitality by giving him a fig tree which served for all the plantations of attica whatever may be the way it came to them they received it with transports of joy it was planted with great pomp in the centre of the public square at athens from that time the spot was sacred to them ere long the fame of the figs of attica spread far and wide they were the best in greece and the magistrates strictly prohibited their exportation this law was afterwards modified that is the exportation of figs was allowed on payment of a very heavy duty they then appointed inspectors whose duty it was to discover contraventions and report them thence arose the name of siophant taken by those informers a vile and despised set of men whose denunciations were often false and with whom the infamous authors of a base calamity were eventually assimilated in greece every one feasted on figs it was sort of a regular gastronomic furor which knew no bounds and the wise plato himself ceased to be a philosopher when presented with a basket of that fruit as an ailment it was considered so wholesome and strengthening that on the first introduction of them they constituted the food of the athlete whose patron hercules had also fed on them in his youth the superiority of the greek figs was so generally acknowledged that the kings of persia even had a predilection for them dried ones were served on the tables of those ostentatious princes the romans believed according to an antique tradition that their first princes romulus and remus were found under a fig tree on the shore of the tiber they therefore rendered signal honors to this tree when it was brought into italy they planted it in the forum and it was under its shade that a sacrifice was offered every year to the shepherdess who had suckled their founder it may nevertheless be affirmed that no one before cato had noticed the fig tree which probably appeared in rome at the same period as the peach apricot and other trees of asia sixty years afterwards varro speaks of it as a novelty from beyond sea and points out to us that its various species have retained the names of the countries whence they came those varieties were so numerous that pliny counts no less than twenty-nine of them and the designation of the greater part recalled to mind the illustrious families who had taken them under their patronage the people of the north especially the moderns cannot well explain the extraordinary infatuation of the ancient southern nations for the fruit of the fig tree perhaps we ought to look for the reason in the nourishing fresh and sweet qualities of its pulp and in the numerous plantations of those trees which sometimes furnished an agreeable food to entire armies when other provisions failed that of philip of macedon owed its preservation to the figs brought to it by the magnesians a long time before david received with joy from the hands of abigail two hundred baskets of dried figs for himself and his exhausted men more than once the far-famed reputation of some beautiful plantations of fig trees brought long and disastrous wars on an entire country as steel attracts lightning xerxes left persia and rushed on attica 
to take possession of those delicious figs whose renown only had crossed his territory and it was partly to eat the figs of rome that the gauls waged war against italy thank heaven we have now more respect for our neighbors fig trees the best things in the world have had their detractors and the fig is not an exception philotimus and diphilus looked upon it as bad food galen was unwell after partaking of figs and he recommends us to mix almonds with them hippocrates himself thought them indigestible and advised to drink plentifully after eating them all these great men may have thought been right but the greeks their contemporaries acted as if they were wrong happily we are not called upon to decide between them figs were commonly served on an aristocratic tables with salt pepper vinegar and some aromatics they were eaten fresh or dried in the oven or on hurdles in the sun raspberry tree the ancients hardly mentioned the raspberry tree which they placed on a level with the bramble the latins call it bramble of ida because it was common on that mountain there can be no doubt however that the romans knew how to appreciate the raspberry tree so much esteemed in our days currant tree the moderns have attempted to ennoble our two kinds of currants by decorating them with latin names which recall their antiquity vain effort to all appearance the greeks and people of italy were not acquainted with the currant tree although they well deserved to possess this delicious fruit strawberry plant among the greeks the name of the strawberry indicated its tenuity this fruit forming hardly a mouthful with the latin the name reminded one of the delicious perfume of this plant both nations were equally fond of it and applied the same care to its cultivation virgil appears to place it in the same rank with flowers and ovid gives it a tender epithet which delicate palates would not disavow neither does this luxurious poet forget the wild strawberry which disappears beneath its modest foliage but whose presence the scented air reveals transported to the tables of the lucilli by the side of its more brilliant and more beautiful sister a flattering murmur often bore testimony to its merit and nature triumphed in the midst of ingenious guests soliciting of art what they repudiated in nature mulberry tree the ancient mulberry tree was considered the wisest and most prudent of trees because it took care they said not to let the smallest of its buds come to light before the cold had entirely disappeared not to return then however it hastened to repair lost time and a single night was sufficient to see it display its beautiful flowers which the next morning brightly opened at the rising of aurora the voluptuous romans reposing late on their soft couches the day after the fatigues of a banquet worthy of vitalis did not trouble themselves much about this interesting phenomenon which occurred if pliny does not mistake in the gardens of their villas but they knew that mulberries agree with the stomach and they afford hardly any nourishment and easily digest therefore no sooner had they opened their heavy eyelids than an egyptian boy attentive living bell at a sign disappeared and quickly returned bringing a small crystal vase filled with mulberry juice and wine reduced by boiling 
this beneficent fruit preserved in this mixture all its sweet flavor and enabled the rich patrician to await until evening the hour for his four new excesses it is quite evident that this luscious fruit was a native of canaan for the high road by which the tribes of israel went up to the feast at jerusalem lay through the valley of baca or mulberry tree and the whole tract of country from akron to gaza abounded in these trees end of section fourteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section fifteen of pantrophion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c pantrophion by alex soyer shell fruit almond tree this tree whose fruit was called at one time greek nut and at another thasian nut is a native of paphiglonia according to hermippus the nations of the east thought much of almonds and jacob found them worthy of appearing among the presents he designed for joseph the almond tree of naxus supplied the markets of athens the romans in their turn sought them and believed like the physicians spoken by plutarch that it was only necessary to eat five or six almonds to acquire the ability of drinking astonishingly besides this fruit had not always so mean a destination the disciples of epicius made it one of the most delicate of dishes here it is as taught to them by their master take almonds that have been pounded in a mortar and mix them with honey pepper garum milk eggs and a little oil submit the whole to the action of a slow fire the ancients were acquainted with the oil of almonds of which they made nearly the same use as we do ourselves but they possessed in addition an infallible means of augmenting the fertility of the almond tree it was very simple a hole was made in the tree a stone was introduced into it and thanks to the virtue of this new manure the branches soon bent under the weight of almonds the good almonds come from barbary and the south of france when young they are preserved like green apricots they are eaten at table fresh or dry in comfits pastry etc they are also used to make great and refreshing emulsions the oil extracted from almonds even bitter ones is very sweet it is best extracted cold by pressure the pulp is employed under the name of almond paste for several purposes one of which is to render the skin soft and flexible walnut tree asia the cradle of most fruit trees gave birth also to the walnut tree it is believed to be a native of persia and its pleasing foliage already adorned in biblical times the orchards of the east one of the most ancient of the sacred books informs us that it was known to the jews and it may be inferred from a passage in the song of solomon that they possessed numerous plantations of this tree among the persians walnuts were not lavished on the first comer as with us the sovereign reserved them for his dessert and the people were obliged to abstain from them but perhaps it may be said that however fond this prince may have been of walnuts he could not eat all that were produced in his states the objection is embarrassing we own and chroniclers are silent on this point but let us suppose that this generous potentate distributed to his favorites the walnuts from which his sat 
unsated appetite was compelled to abstain and indeed we find that a king of persia sent some to the greeks who called them royal persian nuts in gratitude and remembrance of the august gift they did still better the king of olympus had a great liking for this fruit so they hastened to consecrate it to him and the nuts of jupiter were cultivated with honor in the whole of greece italy received the walnut tree from attica and by degrees the conquerors of the world introduced it to the different countries of europe the romans imitators of the piety of the greeks placed this tree also under protection of the most powerful of their gods one of their most whimsical customs perhaps owed its origin to this consecration which will serve to explain it after the wedding feast the bridegroom strewed in the nuptial chamber at night several baskets of walnuts which children hastened to pick up this was they said a kind of offering to jupiter and thus he was entreated to grant his supreme patronage to the husband and to adorn the wife with the virtues of juno the god could not have failed to smile at this part of the request of blind mortals and it asserted that at times he condescended not to grant it others have given a different interpretation according to them the walnut being covered with a double envelope when fresh became a presage of abundance and prosperity it would be too tedious to relate all the singular options to which this ceremony gave rise the most reasonable appears to be that adopted by certain commentators walnuts say they served as playthings for children and by throwing them on the ground the day of his wedding the bridegroom made it understood that he and his companion renounced the frivolities of youth henceforth to devote themselves to the serious exigencies of a family this fruit was considered astringent stomachic and proper to facilitate digestion it was made in preserve and eaten in small quantity mixed with figs in this manner paralysis of the tongue was avoided an effect to which it was believed those who partook of them to excess were exposed green walnuts were much esteemed they were served at dessert notwithstanding the opinion of hercules of tartanium who looked upon them as a stimulant to the appetite and advised a trial of them at the beginning of a repast when pompey had made himself master of the palace of mithridates he had search made everywhere for the recipe of the famous antidote against poison used by the king at length it was found it was very simple however we offer it to the curious pound with care two walnuts two dried figs twenty leaves of rue and a grain of salt swallow this mixture precipitate it by the assistance of a little wine and you have nothing to fear from the most active poison for the space of twenty-four hours nut tree the greeks gave hazelnuts the name of pontic nuts and theophrastus called them nuts of hercule because the territory of that capital of the kingdom of pontus produced the best the latins at first retained the same designation for this fruit but afterwards the environs of Prenest and Avellinum, supplying them with a great quantity of excellent nuts, they gave them the name of those two cities. They employed also a diminutive to indicate those which came from the first of these localities. The French Aveline, Filbert, and Noisette, hazelnuts, are evidently borrowed from the roman vocabulary the inhabitants of Prenest raised the nut tree to sort of religious worship this tree had preserved them from famine during the time hannibal besieged their city and since that memorial epoch it has enriched them for the ancients preferred hazelnuts 
to all other shell fruit as possessing most wholesome and nourishing qualities it was the custom in france some centuries ago at the time of the summer solstice midsummer eve to take all the kitchen utensils and make the most frightful clatter by knocking them one against another. The simpletons of those times imagined that there were no better means of preventing the rain, which, in their opinion, was detrimental to filberts and hazelnuts. Hospinian, who relates this ridiculous custom, does not tell us what results they obtained by all their racket pistachio tree this tree esteemed by the romans is a native of india louis vitellius brought some plants of it from syria to rome under the reign of tiberius a little time subsequently a knight named flaccus pompeius introduced it also into spain galleon doubted whether pistachio nuts were good for the stomach Avicenna proved the contrary, and several centuries before the Arabian physician, Roman epicures had courageously demonstrated that this fruit never does harm in whatever form it may be presented, whether raw or roasted, alone or accompanied with garum and salt. Chestnut Tree According to some writers, the chestnut tree owes its name to the city of Castana, in thessaly where they maintained it originated on the contrary it comes from sardis in lydia if we are to believe the physician diphilus who calls chestnuts acorns of sardis and says they are nourishing but indigestible amaryllis was fond of this fruit but amaryllis was only a shepherdess and her beauty did not prevent her from having rather rustic tastes. The Roman ladies abandoned the chestnut to that low class of citizens whose palates, incapable of improvement, remain always stationary in the midst of the incessant progress of cookery, sad example of invincible frugality which the most exciting fumets fail to arose. Nevertheless, there was a soft, tender species of chestnut, castanet moles, which were allowed on some of the tables of the higher class of citizens, and recommended themselves by their delicate pulp to the attention of their guests. Perhaps oil of chestnuts was obtained from this particular kind. To render the chestnuts more agreeable and wholesome, they must be peeled of their skins, which is very tough. Put into boiling water, it penetrates and softens the bitter pedicle, the tan, covering them, and facilitates its removal from the flowery substance. When the chestnuts can be easily stripped of this pedicle by the pressure of the fingers, take the jar from the fire, shake them well on all sides. The tan will soon detach itself from the surface, and be altogether removed then take them out and after they have been shaken in a sieve made purposely they are washed in cold water to take away with what remains of the tan the bitter water they may have preserved they are then cooked without water in a well-covered vessel and upon a moderate fire to eat chestnuts green all year Boil them in water for fifteen or twenty minutes. Put them afterwards in a common oven, one hour after the bread has been taken out. By this double operation the chestnuts acquire a degree of cooking and desiccation, by which they can be preserved a very long time, provided they are kept in a dry place. They can be used afterwards by putting them to warm in a bain-marie. Detour pomegranate cerise disconsolate on account of the loss of her daughter to whom pluto destined the sceptre of hell implored the ruler of olympus to restore posperine 
Jupiter promised that the favor should be granted, provided that she had not partaken of anything in the infernal regions. Now she had eaten some grains of a pomegranate, very few indeed. Some serious authors have said three, others, quite as respectable, say nine. The fact is, however, Proscopine had broken her fast. Therefore she might think her fortunate in being allowed to pass six months on earth and six months in the abode of darkness. This little mythologic story informs us that the pomegranate tree was known to antiquity, and that the garden of the Elysian fields contained most excellent fruit for the use of its melancholy inhabitants. The pomegranate, whose acidulated flavor is so pleasing to the inhabitants of hot climates, was first cultivated in the east, then in Africa, but especially in the environs of Carthage, from whence the Romans brought it into Italy, where it was commonly called the Carthaginian apple. It was also named Granatham, on account of the number of its seeds. Pliny distinguishes five different species of pomegranate. Columella teaches the way to rear this tree, and Aspicius treats of the preservation of its fruit, to do which is only necessary to plunge it in boiling water, take it out immediately, and suspend it from the ceiling. The Greeks were very fond of pomegranates. The finest came from Attica, so celebrated by the genius of its inhabitants, and from Boeotia, that privileged soil where agriculture and stupidity flourished together. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 16 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Lano County, Texas, USA. Pantrophion by Alexis Sawyer. Chapter 15 Animal Food. Bread, vegetables, and fruit for a long time provided man with a sufficient and easy alimentation. Wandering with his flocks in search of cool pasture, he only exacted their wool wherewith to make the clothing requisite for his migratory life, their services to assist him in hollowing a difficult furrow, and their firstborn as a most agreeable offering to the all-powerful master of heaven and earth. We may also suppose that, in the pastoral ages, the wandering tribes of Asia added to their vegetable food the milk of their ewes, goats, or cows, although it is not mentioned in the book of Genesis, at a very early period it is true, but which forms a nourishment nature seems to point out as proper to infancy and old age. Mankind, therefore, abstained from animal food during many centuries. Ecclesiastical and profane writers seem to agree on this point. Habit had not yet produced disgust, and curiosity the fatal mother of experience and sensuality. To eat was for them the most natural and simple action of life. The art of cookery tries, makes choice, and improves. That art did not exist. The frightful cataclysm which overthrew the world, and of which the history of every nation gives proofs more or less confused, came to modify this state of things. Men were obliged to be fed with more substantial food, and our forebears were allowed to add to vegetables and the herbs of the country, animated beings, and all that which had life and motion. The Magiric Science, therefore, began in the year of the world, 1656. From that period, indeed, the cooking of meat, however little complicated it may have been, required an attention, care, and study, which prepared the development of that marvelous faculty 
to which no possible limit can be assigned, the last to disappear, and to which, in fact, are related nearly all the actions of human life, the sense of taste. Heathen authors, guided by the lights of reason, some gleams of tradition, and perhaps not absolutely strangers to the writings of Moses, agree pretty well on the diet of the Golden Age, that age of innocence, acorns, and happiness, when everywhere were seen streams of milk and nectar and honey flowing from the hollow oaks and other trees of the forests. But when the question is to point out the time at which the use of animal food was introduced, ideas become clouded, and highly intelligent minds, bewildered by the obscurity which envelops the subject, have frequently appealed to absurd legends and ridiculous fables, invoking the aid of their false and contested authority. Xenocrates pretends that Triptolemus forbade the Athenians to eat animals. Man must, then, have been still frugivorous for four centuries after the deluge. This opinion found contradictors, who maintained that man contented himself with fruit only because fire was wanting to cook meat. But Prometheus came and taught him how to draw the useful element from the flint which concealed it, and was the first to venture on the sacrifice of an ox. This happened in the year of the world, 2412. All this is a mistake, say other and more sensible writers. Here is the truth on this difficult point. The goddess Ceres had sown a field, and the wheat came up as desired, when a pig entered, tumbled about, and caused considerable damage, which so irritated the lady that she punished him with death. Now, as a pig is good for nothing except to eat, this one was eaten, and from that day, so fatal to the swinish race, mankind learnt to appreciate the flesh of animals. At the same time, Bacchus killed a goat he found nibbling at the tendrils of his darling vines, and Hyberbius, son of Mars, and a slasher like his father, amused himself by killing another, in order to become familiar thus early with scenes of combat. These goats were roasted, and as experience had as yet furnished no rule of comparison, and formed no taste, that exquisite sentiment of the beautiful in the plastic arts and of the good in the culinary science. It was decided that this dish was very tolerable. Hitherto the bovine race had only lost one individual. Its sad destiny began in the year 1506, before our era, under the reign of the fourth king of Athens, Erectonius, on a day of great solemnity, when an ox, pressed probably by hunger, came near the altar, and devoured one of the sacred cakes which heathen piety had dedicated to Jupiter. The zealous Diomus rushed forward and pierced the heart of the sacrilegious quadruped. It might be supposed that the anger of the god was immediately appeased, but no, the terrible Jupiter knitted his brows, Olympus was in great agitation, and pestilence came and spread its ravages amongst the Athenians. All did not die, but all were struck, and to propitiate the implacable scourge, they thought of nothing better than to institute the bufonic feast, which happily re-established their health, and which they continued to celebrate every year. They sacrificed an ox, offered a peace to Jupiter, and the faithful divided the rest among themselves. At Tyre, in Phoenicia, meat was consumed on the altar, but the gods had the profit of it, and nobody else. Some fruit and a few vegetables were sufficient for the frugality of people enjoying innocent and primitive customs. But it happened in the time of Pygmalion, that a young sacrificer, having perceived that a piece of the victim had fallen, hastened to pick it up and replace it carefully on the fire of the altar. In the performance of this operation, he burned his fingers, and instantly put them into his mouth to lessen the pain. As he could not help tasting the fat with which they were covered, the greedy young man experienced a new sensation, 
which tempted him to swallow a mouthful, then a second. A portion of the victim was eaten. He put another piece under his cloak, and with his wife made the finest supper in his life. All went on very well until the prince, being informed of this profanation, loaded them with reproaches and condemned both to the punishment of death. A gluttony, however, is rash. Other sacrificers ate, at first in secret, of this forbidden food. Then they were imitated, and at last, by degrees, meat passed from the altar of the gods, who did not taste it, to the tables of mortals, who feasted upon it. People may or may not believe this anecdote, which informs us in so satisfactory a manner of the epoch at which man, from being frugivorous, became carnivorous. But one thing is certain, that in the time of Homer, there is only eighty years between him and Pygmalion, the flesh of animals was then much in fashion, for we read of his giving to his heroes, as their principal food, a whole hog three years old, and oxen roasted, not even jointed. Some ideologists and dreamers have risen against the use of meat. Their declamations, often very eloquent, have been read, but from Pythagoras, a sublime and honest enthusiast, down to the whimsical J. J. Rousseau, who, by the way, was very fond of mutton chops and bouffe à la mode, although he exclaimed against the cruelty of mankind, whose hands were stained with the blood of animals. No nation has yet determined to adopt the patriarchal diet of the first ages of the world. Plutarch was a vegetarian, and we possess one of his treatises in which he endeavors to prove that flesh is not the natural food of man. As a conclusive answer, meat was eaten, so when an ancient philosopher one day denied the movement of matter, a person reduced him to silence by walking. But if animal diet has, from time to time, met with a small number of detractors, what an immense crowd of apologists and adepts has it not also found? It would signify nothing to name individuals. Let us point out whole nations. Who is not acquainted with the delicacy and luxury of the Assyrians and Persians? Who is not aware that the genius of the Greeks improved the culinary art, and that their cooks were famous in history? What of the Syracusans, whose dainty and curious ideas passed as a proverb, and of the Athenians, who were so passionately fond of the pleasures of the table, or of Naples, Tarentum, and Sybaris, so celebrated for their good cheer? The Romans surpassed even these refinements and sumptuous repasts, Theirs is the honor of the pontiff's feasts, the excesses of Capre, the profusions of Vitellius, of Galba, Nero, and Caligula. They have the honor of the banquet of Gita, which lasted three days and ended by exhausting the alphabetic list of all the dishes that the universe could supply. May heaven preserve us from imitating such prodigies of intemperance and gluttonous folly. But let us at least be allowed to use with moderation the good that providence has granted us, and which it has not forbidden us to make agreeable and savory. The inhabitants of the air, earth, and water entered within our domains, as well as the fruits of the fields, on the day when the Creator condescended to say to his creature, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Rearing of Cattle All ancient legislators have bestowed the most serious attention to the rearing and preservation of cattle. The Mosaic Law, in this respect, enters into details which reveal the most profound wisdom, a delicate and minute research which cannot be too much admired more attentive to propagate useful animals than to flatter the sensuality of nations, this law forbids their being mutilated. It requires the Hebrews to treat with generosity the companions of their labor. 
that they shall interest themselves in the preservation of their brothers and even in their enemies oxen that different species of unequal strength shall not be yoked together to the plough and in order that the cattle may not suffer from an excess of hard and constant labor moses assures to them at least one day of rest in a week it is well known with what care the patriarchs surrounded their flocks for them they wandered from region to region and only stopped where pasture was abundant in imitation of those fathers of nations the princes of the east and the grecian chiefs were at first shepherds and were perhaps indebted to the innocent occupations of the fields for the sweet and sacred title of pastors of man the founder of rome did not forget the flocks and herds in those famous laws which were to assure the prosperity of his rising city one of them allowed the possessor of an estate to take up the acorns which might fall into his field from his neighbor's property and to divide them among the cattle he is rearing under the republic it was severely forbidden to ill-use beasts of burden and others by the Licinian law each farmer was required to proportion the number of his sheep and oxen to the extent of his land the thorian law contains very wise regulations relative to the quality and keeping up of pasture moreover it is to be remarked that the romans never fixed the limits of a rural property nor formed a new colony without giving their first care to the spots appointed to feed their flocks the quiet possession of which was assured by the emperors adrian among others did not encourage thieves this prince ordered that whoever carried away cattle grazing in meadows should be condemned to work in the mines that those who should have been convicted of robbery several times should be beheaded and that thieves found with arms in their hands should become the prey of wild beasts illustrious families by birth often added to their name a sort of epithet originating either from bulls goats or sheep which were brought up on the land of their villas this singular custom proves the extraordinary attachment which the romans had for their flocks one of these enthusiasts tremelius scrofa had written a treatise on the art of assorting and feeding cattle greek and latin geoponics have also transmitted to us some details full of interest and which often contain most useful information upon the various species of animals which the ancients preferred and the particular care they took in the preservation and development of various breeds pagan theology reckoned among its thirty thousand gods some few protective divinities of flocks these shepherds invoked pales and anna perenna dealers of oxen offered sacrifices to bubona whose special care it was to see that they were fat and healthy the animals chosen to be fattened were put under the protection of this deity and were fed in the following manner the first day they had given to them cabbages soaked in vinegar then for five days straw mixed with wheat bran from the seventh day they had nothing but bruised barley which was gradually and judiciously increased till the twelfth day these oxen were fed at midnight at break of day at twelve o'clock and at three in the afternoon they were allowed to drink only twice that is after the third and fourth meal on the thirteenth day they were led to market markets the hebrews held their cattle market at the gates of their cities and from this circumstance perhaps is derived those expressions so frequent in the sacred writings the gates of the flocks the sheep's gate etc which no doubt designated the different quarters of jerusalem where shepherds and cattle dealers were accustomed to congregate among the greeks vast airy public places used to receive under the orders and with the authorization of the epimolites or curators the animals and meat necessary for the subsistence of the citizens at rome the horned cattle market was situated in the eighth region behind the capitoline mount 
It was a magnificent place, surrounded with beautiful galleries, in the midst of which stood on its pedestal a gigantic brazen bull, at a little distance from the Temple of Hercules, a round, mean edifice, where dealers and their customers went to adore this god, the patron of butchers. The way to reach the pig market was by going round the Quirinal Mount, near the bronze horses of Tyrodates, in the seventh region of the town. This market was the most important of all, on account of the immense consumption of pork by the Romans. As soon as the officer of the Roman prefect appeared, the principal butchers gathered round him, he examined the cattle, regulated the sale, and fixed a price on the meat, from which they were not allowed to deviate, and then only was the market open butchers. Nothing among the Greeks indicates that they had butchers in the heroic ages. The warriors of Homer had no want of them, so great was their skill in cutting up the enormous pieces placed before them. Ulysses acquired a reputation by his dexterity in this art, and it is more than probable that his martial companions also distinguished themselves by this kind of merit. As soon as luxury had introduced into Greece that effeminate kind of existence, which only permits certain men to be engaged in the painful or repulsive details of everyday life, bothutes, or bullock slaughterers, became indispensable, and of them the meat was bought by the pound, weighed in the scale as now. The Romans had at first butchers who dealt in the same way, and who continued to do so for a long time, but they afterwards employed the following most extravagant method. The buyer shut one of his hands, the seller did the same, each of them suddenly opened the whole or a few of his fingers. If the fingers were even on each side, the seller had the price he pleased. If they were odd, the buyer gave his own price. This was called Macere. The Mycation was suppressed in the year 360 by a decree of Apronianus, which is worth quoting because it points out in a clear and precise manner the attributions of the Roman butcher and the system of sale since followed. Reason and experience have proved to us that it is of public utility to suppress the practice of Mycation for the sale of cattle, and that it is more advisable to sell by weight than to trust to a game with the fingers. We therefore ordain that, after the weight of the animal is ascertained, the head, feet, and tallow shall belong to the butcher who has killed, prepared, and cut it up. This shall be his wages. The skin, flesh, and entrails shall belong to the master butcher who is to retail it. In this manner, the buyer and seller will know the weight of the meat on sale, and each will find this method to his advantage. We will and decree that this ordinance be executed for ever under pain of death. There were at first in Rome two corporations or colleges of butchers. One had to take care that the city was always sufficiently supplied with oxen, calves, and sheep. The other was to provide that immense capital with the quantity of hogs necessary, and it would be difficult to form an idea of the number consumed by the Romans. Every day a distribution was made to the people, by Valentinian's order of 24,086 pounds and 8 ounces of pork. To this amount, already considerable, must be added the truly prodigious daily sale for the entire population, from the highest to the lowest, were all passionately fond of this kind of food. The obligations and privileges of these two corporate bodies were nearly the same as those of the bakers. The children could not, under any pretext whatsoever, abandon the trade of their fathers without incurring the entire loss of their share in the common benefit allowed by the college. And be it remembered, this trade was very lucrative, so much so that those who followed it in Rome always enjoyed a degree of opulence which sometimes caused the people to murmur. They elected from among themselves a chief who judged their differences he was, however, subordinate to the prefect of Rome. The members of the two corporations cut, weighed, and retailed the meat, 
They had under them working butchers, who killed, skinned, and trimmed the animals, and then brought them each one to the shop of his master. In the sequel, the two colleges met and formed one. Subsequently, under the reign of Nero, which seemed at the beginning to promise the most brilliant prospect, the principal market for butchers became an edifice equal in magnificence to the baths, the circus, and amphitheaters. Eventually, it was found necessary to erect two new buildings on account of the increasing extent of the city and its inhabitants. The Roman butchers sold both fresh and salt meat, like our own of the present day. It is not necessary to enter into any explanation respecting the first. As to the second, their method of preparation was somewhat different from the way we manage it now. The animals they intended to salt were kept from drinking anything on the eve of the day they were to be killed. They boned the meat and sprinkled it lightly with pounded salt. Then, after having well dried off all dampness, they again sprinkled some more salt and placed the pieces, so as not to touch each other, in vessels which had been used for oil or vinegar. They poured sweet wine over, covered the whole with straw, and strewed snow all around in order to make the meat better and more tender. When the cook wanted to extract the salt, he first boiled the meat well in milk and afterwards in soft water. The flesh of various animals was also well preserved without salt. The only thing necessary was to cover each piece with honey and to place it in a vessel hermetically closed, hung in a cool place. This operation was usually performed in winter and succeeded equally well with meat, either cooked or raw. The following are some of the statutes of the pork butchers in France during the Middle Ages. No one was to cook pork if it was not sufficient or had not good marrow. No one could make sausages of anything but pork. No one could sell black puddings, for it is a perilous viand. The French word charcutier, pork butcher, is derived from caro cocta, chair cuite, cooked meat. The numerous regulations concerning the butchers in France during the 14th century rendered it difficult to carry on the trade. Prohibition to buy cattle except in the markets. Prohibition to buy pigs fed by barbers or oil dealers. Prohibition to kill cattle not a fortnight old. Prohibition to kill cattle on the eve of fast days. Prohibition to sell stale meat. Prohibition to keep meat more than two days in winter or more than one day and a half in summer. Prohibition to sell meat by lamplight or candlelight. The regulations respecting the cleanliness of the slaughterhouses and the shambles were very long and very severe. A butcher in Paris kept but one single kind of meat in the 14th century. Pork was sold only at saint Genevieve, mutton at saint Marceau, veal at saint Germain, and beef at the market of the Châtelet. Philip Augustus gave statutes to the butchers of Paris in the year 1182. He enjoined them to observe the Sabbath, and permitted them to work on the other days, with the exception of the great festivals. The regulations imposed upon them in the 17th century are to the effect that they shall not keep the fat from one week to another, that they shall not mix the different kinds of suet, and, lastly, that they shall not have more than three shops, and shall not allow the blood to run in the streets. End of section 16, Animal Food Recording by Bill Mosley, Lano County, Texas, USA.